In this lesson, we are going to take a closer look at PNIDs or piping and instrumentation diagrams. We'll review some of the key details to be aware of on a PNID when conducting a hazard and operability study, otherwise referred to as a HAZOP, and how these details help in identifying potential hazardous scenarios. Let's start by asking, what is a PNID and how is it used in a HAZOP? A PNID is a schematic representation of a process using symbols and piping connections to demonstrate how pieces of equipment are connected and the direction of the process flow between components in the system. A PNID also shows piping specifications and instrument details. PNIDs are used in HAZOPs as a way to understand the process and identify potential hazardous modes of failure in the system. I wonder when the issued for HAZOP drawings will come in for the upcoming risk assessment. I have just received this set of PNIDs for an upcoming HAZOP. We'll be taking a look at the first two PNIDs in the set. First, let's look at the flow path of the products through the system. You can see our first drawing connects to the second one here, showing that the drain of the inlet separator and the basket strainer combine and flow towards the tank. Understanding how PNIDs are connected is essential to understanding the process. Now let's look at these missing page connections. Do we know the maximum incoming pressure from the pipeline and temperature coming in on pipeline A? The design pressure of the pipeline is 4,960 kPAG, but the maximum incoming pressure we would ever see is 4,000 kPAG, with a maximum incoming temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. And what about the maximum incoming pressure and temperature from pipeline B? The design pressure of the pipeline is 9,930 kPAG, but the maximum incoming pressure we would ever see is 8,000 kPAG, with a maximum incoming temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. And do we know what the maximum design temperature of the piping is? The piping can handle up to 65 degrees Celsius, so it should be able to handle the temperature of the emulsion from both lines. Great! It is important to determine the maximum pressure coming into a system to identify potential blocked flow and reverse flow over pressure scenarios. Since the emulsion is coming in at a higher pressure from pipeline B, it may be possible to have a reverse flow scenario causing an overpressure of the piping rated for 4,960 kPAG. This is prevented by this spec blind. These concerns can be identified on our PNIDs. That is why it is important to identify pressure and temperature spec breaks on piping lines. A pressure spec break defines where design pressure of piping changes. A temperature spec break shows where the design temperature of the piping changes. Finding spec breaks and noting them on PNIDs can help identify which sections of piping are more susceptible to overpressuring and where a rupture is most likely to occur. Other breaks to make note of on a PNID are the inside-outside building breaks and the underground-above-ground breaks. How are these breaks related to a HAZOP? Well, knowing the building limits help define the severity of a loss of containment. A pipe rupture inside a building may have different consequences to a rupture outside of a building. The difference between above or below ground sections of the system can also have an effect on the severity of the consequences, as well as drawing our attention to possible freezing or thermal concerns on piping. The consequences of a spill would be much higher outside the building than inside a contained area. This would also impact the cleanup cost. Right, that makes sense. It is also important to know which buildings have fire and gas detection, as they may be important safeguards in a loss of containment scenario. Great. After this step, it is useful to look at the energy sources like pumps, compressors, and burners in the system capable of causing hazardous scenarios to the more vulnerable sections of piping. Other energy sources can be external, such as ambient temperature or solar radiation. It is important to evaluate pressure sources in a system in order to identify how they may affect piping and equipment. Let's say LCV100 fails closed. The incoming pressure from P100 could overpressure piping. With pumps, it is also worth noting if there is a secondary seal, indicated by a tubing line from the pump to the drain system, or by seal pots. The secondary seal will alter the consequences of a primary seal failure. Wait, 
How can closing LCV100 overpressure piping? The pump can generate above 9,650 kPaG when the discharge is blocked. By closing LCV100, there is a potential to overpressure the pump discharge piping. Great. That brings me to the next detail to look out for. Car seals. Car seal valves, denoted with a CSO for car seal open or CSC for car seal closed, are valves that are under administrative control to ensure that they are in the correct position. This is done to mitigate human error in a design. For a HAZOP, these valves being in the wrong position is usually out of scope, but it is still important to ensure valves that need to be car sealed are car sealed and denoted as such on the PNIDs. Ah, I see. That makes sense. The isolation valves of PSV100 are also car sealed. We don't usually touch those valves unless we have to service the PSV. Exactly. Valves up and downstream of a pressure safety valve, or PSV, should be car sealed open to ensure open flow path for relief. When looking at PSVs for a HAZOP, it is also important to note the location and sizing case. The appropriate location and sizing case of PSVs is essential for ensuring overpressure risk in a system is reliably mitigated. It is also important to ensure that PSVs are relieving to a safe location. It says here that the PSV relieves to a pop tank, so I think we are good. Great. Continuing on, another detail to pay attention to on the PNIDs are the fail positions of valves. The fail positions indicate what position a valve will default to during a shutdown of the facility. Fail positions should be indicated on the PNIDs and should bring the site to a safe state in the event of an emergency shutdown or loss of power. Should we also look at the closing time of actuated valves? How does that apply to a HAZOP? The concern with the valve closure time is transient overpressure if the valve closes too quickly. Additional information you may want, along with the closure time, would be any transient analysis information done on the valve closure to ensure transient overpressure is not credible. That does make a lot of sense. Is that information usually on the PNID? No. Valve closure time is something you should ask for before or during a HAZOP. Sometimes the PNIDs don't have all the information you need to perform a thorough risk assessment, so always try to gather all the missing information you may need. Understanding the instrumentation and control system philosophy on a PNID can also be very beneficial to understanding how risks can be detected and mitigated. Many safeguards use instrumentation. PNIDs show transmitters and meters throughout the process and indicate associated alarms and shutdowns. Often, sensors will have trip indications, shown as high-high and low-low, with specific set points, to take certain actions, such as tripping pumps or closing valves. These set points are sometimes shown on the PNIDs. However, the actions are not usually outlined. Understanding how these components operate and the actions they take are imperative in assessing safeguards for a safe design. It is important to ask questions if you need additional information. Walking through the PNIDs prior to a HAZOP can help the meeting run smoothly while ensuring all possible points of failure are identified. Key details from today's lesson include understanding the process parameters associated with unknown connections, identifying pressure and temperature spec breaks, identifying energy sources in the system that can cause hazardous scenarios, noting any valves with administrative controls, valve failure position and closure time, and details on shutdowns and alarms for critical safeguards. As facilitators, it is important that we consider all modes of failure and ensure that the process is safe and operable.